All right, electrical system. Um, you know, back in the day, uh, and a lot of your producers had some older pieces of equipment, you know, older John Deere's cases, you know, old semis, you know, whatever. And the electrical system was your starter motor and your lights and, you know, your accessories, okay? Fast forward to a 2010, 2012, 2014 model year, and we are way beyond that, way beyond. All right, we're talking, you know, transmissions, we're electronic transmissions, electronic brake controls, automatic traction controls, um, electronic unit injectors, high pressure common rail injectors. The list just goes on and on and on. And for, for your, your producers, it can be very, very overwhelming when they look in there and they pop the hood on the semi, they pop the hood on that tractor and they see a whole bunch of wires like, holy crap olas. It can be very, very overwhelming, all right? Always tell them if they think they have an electrical problem, forget all that sensor and all that crap, go back to your basics, all right? And that's kind of what we're gonna start off looking at right here, okay? So one of your basics of your electrical system is this thing right here, your batteries. You're dead in the water if you don't have good batteries in a conversation, all right? Your battery, the, the only reason your battery, the, actually the battery is there for two reasons. Number one is to start the engine, okay? Number two is to back up the alternator. When you turn on your air conditioner, your radio, when you click the electric drive in for your header, the alternator is supplying the juice for that, not your battery. Now, if you start adding, or your producer starts adding accessories, you know, you've got extra stereos in there, you've got your AFS, you've got your John Deere Green Link, you've got CB radios, or, you know, whatever, that puts extra load on that alternator. So if the alternator can't keep up, that's when the battery will kick in and help out. So that's the only two reasons that battery is there. Now, with that being said, if our batteries aren't up to snuff, well, we're not even going to get the damn engine started. We're not going anywhere, okay? So when we're looking at our batteries, we also need to tie in our cables. Our batteries must be of the correct size and amperage. Um, I'm a firm believer of the battery, you get what you pay for. Because there is some real, and I'll use the word cheap, I don't use it real cheap very often, but there are some cheap damn batteries out there. All right, they're really, and you get what you pay for. If you want a good battery, you're going to have to spend some money, all right? Most of your ag equipment, they're running off the 8D batteries, so they're those big 150-pound honkers that have a, you know, one person on each end type of thing, all right? Anywhere from two to four of those in, a, in one particular vehicle. Those things, a good one of them, you're going to put you over 200 bucks a pop, all right? They're not cheap, but they're worth the money, okay? But they're only as good as long as we look after them. They're, they're an, inanimate object. They can't look after themselves. So that's where we come in, all your producers. So we start looking at corrosion. All right. How many of you have popped the hood in your own vehicle and seen some pretty yucky battery terminals? Yeah, I'd be one of those people. All right. Okay. Um, corrosion equals resistance. Equals coke. Clean. Yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> No, it's not actually. <laughs> Let's have a, have a quick electrical lesson. So in an electrical circuit, you know, with the, we have wires and we have connectors and terminals, right? So let's just uh, go with a really, really simple system with one switch and one light bulb, okay? So I have, and we'll just, just for argument's sake, we'll use the battery as our power source. So electrons come out of the positive of the battery. They're going to go to the switch. Now, if that switch is in the off position, that's where we're going to stop. We're not going anywhere. And obviously, our lamp's not going to light. We turn the switch on, and we close that circuit. So now electrons can flow through the switch, through the light bulb, illuminate the light bulb, and come all the way back around. Oh, we're uh, locked out. If you would, please all the way back around to our battery. 
The battery is their little home, and that's all they care about is going home. Okay? They're, so the voltage is what we call electrical pressure. The amperage is actually what's doing the work. Okay, so the voltage is pushing the amperage through that circuit. I have to have some type of load in the circuit. In our little example, that would the one thing that's a load in that circuit is my light bulb. The switch is not or should not be a load. All right? Because it's not doing any damn work. We want the light bulb to do all the work. We start pushing the, the current flow through there. We light it up and we know we're working good. Those electrons go back home. The load is going to use up the voltage. All right? And again, this is like a semester long class, which incidentally, there's another lab opening up, so you can get into that class too this fall. Okay? Just put in plug in for our program. Okay? So. Doesn't have anything else to do. Well, there you go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But my issue is going to be my issue is going to be getting her to class on time. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't that out. So Nicole's going to have her, her own service truck at the end of the semester. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. If we have resistance such as corrosion, that would mean that we now have more than one load in that circuit. So for example, if I have corrosion on the positive terminal of my battery, <coughs> and I also have my lamp in that circuit, I now have two loads. So my 12.6 volts that comes out of that battery is going to have to be split between those loads. All right? So if they're of equal resistance, half of the, the voltage used up on the corrosion, just to get the average through the damn corrosion, the other half is going to go through the lamp, but the lamp is going to be pretty dim because I don't have my 12 volts there, right? Is this kind of making sense? Okay. So anytime you, you, know, you look at your, your producer's combine, their tractor, their pickup truck, and you see that real yucky stuff on top of that battery, well, that's time for, it's a real good time for conversation with them because that is a big time problem. All right. And it could be on the negative post, it could be on the positive post, it could be on both. The <coughs> um, I see a lot of corrosion taking place. So that battery cable is not just one big chunk of metal, it's like a whole bunch of strands of wire kind of wrapped around each other. I have seen corrosion start at the battery and end up at the starter motor. The corrosion has gone all the way down that big old long cable. And that, that, that's a pretty extreme not, it's a good example, it wasn't good to see it. Um, don't even waste your time trying to clean that stuff. You, you know, you're not, you're never ever, it's physically impossible to get that stuff clean. You just replace the damn cable, all right? Um, back to your coat thing, yeah, that works actually. I don't like using it, but in a pinch I will, all right? What I would prefer to see you do is mix up a slurry of baking soda and the hottest water that you can handle, okay? And Make sure that you get your safety glasses on. You know, you guys know what electrolyte in the battery is made of? All right, so it's sulfuric acid and water. And when I was in chemistry in high school, sulfuric acid was some pretty nasty stuff, and I think it hasn't changed a whole lot. You get that stuff in your, you have a cut in your hand, you're going to know exactly where that cut in your hand is at. You get that in your eyes, well, you're just going blind. That's the end of the story, all right? So make sure, make darn sure that you have your safety glasses on, okay? Gloves is also a good thing. Make sure you tell your producers they absolutely have to have safety glasses on. Another thing, just while we're talking about batteries, is these things here and these things here, all right? I have a buddy back home. So the top of a battery is nice and flat. And that's an outstanding place to store your tools when you work on an engine, right? We've all done it, right? Oh yeah, I'm guilty. Okay. So my friend back home was working on his engine. It was a flat top. It was actually a, a, a top post battery. Work on the engine. Put down a tool. Get another one. Put down the tool. Get another one. Put down the tool. Tool, tool, tool. So if I don't have a load, when I have a wire coming out the positive, 
I have to have a load before I hook up to the, to the negative or else I just have an, uh, basically a high current circuit. There's no load to, to, to um, resist that current flow, right? So if I take a wire or a bunch of tools from the positive to the negative, we're going to have some pretty serious welding going on because I've got some current like you wouldn't believe. Well, unfortunately for him, it wasn't a tool that made the connection. It was his ring finger. He put the tool down, bam. He said the only thing that hurt was when he burned these three fingers to pull his ring off. He killed this finger. When he pulled the ring off, and I hope I don't gross anyone out, but all the, the flesh and sinew came off with it. So he just went to the um, ER and had the rest of his finger chopped off. Nothing they could do. All right? It's, pretty, you know, it's a pretty gross story, but my buddy learned the hard way. Okay, that's why I tell everyone, you know, if you work in electrical, if you, in fact, if you work in any system, get the damn watches off and get this off as well. Back in the day when I was a cheapskate, still am, but when I was even worse than what I am now. Ring, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's been telling his wife for years he didn't want to wear that thing. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the day, I used to buy those cheap watches from Walmart that had recycled plastic. Did you know that recycled plastic has shards of metal in it? Did not know that, okay? Until I read it online, actually. And uh, so, I, if you guys have heard of Snopes.com, it's kind of a resource to check out anything. Well, I said, oh yeah, it does. So that's the other thing. You have your two battery terminals. You have tool, 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 tool. Here's your plastic connector with shards of metal making that connection. Can you imagine that? What that would do around your wrist? Like holy crap, that would not be pretty. All right. So the watches come off. The rings come off. When I was in the, um, had my business, I never wore my wedding ring, ever. I've uh, got a brother-in-law north of town who jumped off a semi and his wedding ring hooked up on the top. Didn't lose his finger, but he was hanging there. He, oh God, he was hurting and he was a cousin. All right, so this stuff has no business being on your hands when you're working on equipment. All right, make sure you tell your producers that, okay? It just scares me when I see that. It really does. It really scares me. Okay, so back to our resistance. We need to take care of that corrosion. Um, for a fully charged battery is typically rated at 12.6 volts. 12.4 volts is 75% is charged. 12.2 volts is 50% charged and 12 volts is a plumb ass dead battery. All right, most people think I've got 12, 12, 2, I'm good to go. Well, actually, no, you don't. You think of those big old diesel engines. Um, so, you know, you may or may not know the answer to this, but on a, on a, I'm going to say like a 50 degree day, if I was to measure the amperage from the battery to the starter of a diesel engine and a Cummins pickup, how much amperage do you think that starter would be pulling? Any ideas? Okay, those batteries are putting out about a thousand amps. And we actually measured this um, years ago and it was, was about a, maybe a 40 degree day. The pickup had actually been run for a while, but it was hard starting. I'm not, I didn't remember, don't remember what the problem was. It was pulling 900 amps through that cable to that starter. That is some very, very serious amperage. Now, do you think that 12 volts is going to be enough to push that amperage for that starter? Uh, no. Not even close. Most of your diesel engines, you have to have a minimum of about 400 RPM before that thing will even think about starting. Your el electronically controlled engines, they have uh, engine position and engine RPM sensors that give input to the ECM. ECM, some of your engines, if it doesn't see 400 RPM, <laughs> we're not giving you any fuel. In a conversation, there's not a damn thing you can do about it. All right, this is all back to your battery. Okay, back to your basics. All right? So we take care of our corrosion. Another thing, make sure that these batteries are clamped down, okay? Vibration is the number one killer of batteries. When I talk about a clamp, I'm not talking about a bungee strap, <laughs> all right? Which you probably have all seen with your producers, all right? And a weak one of that. And a weak one of that, exactly. Just kind of hanging out long for the ride, yeah. Now, I'm talking about a metal cover on top with two metal stakes down the side that have an adjusting nut on to tighten them down. All right, that is a battery hold down clamp, okay? 
um, get rid of that vibration as best you can. We want to look out these components. All right. Um, most of your batteries nowadays, you cannot check your electrolyte level. They're sealed. Don't always go, if you've probably seen a, a lot of them have that little green eye in one cell, don't always go off of that little green eye. That's testing one cell. All right, there's a six cell battery. There's 2.1 volts in every cell. So if one cell's bad, they might have another couple, of, or one cell's good with the green eye, excuse me. The green is good. If the others are bad, well, then your whole battery's bad, even though that one cell shows good. You know, one thing that your, your producers, and this is a little bit more expensive, is maybe to get a multimeter, a digital multimeter, okay? Um, you can probably, well, they, they can probably pick up a reasonable one at, you know, like Craftsman Sears for maybe 50 to $100. If you want to go down to HO, go down to Carquest, um, pick up a nice fluke, you're looking at $350, $450, you know? So they can get very expensive very quickly, but a, a good, good one for, in their toolbox would be a real good thing to have, okay? So they can just check what, what the voltage is in their batteries. If it's less than 12.6 volts, uh, maybe it's an old battery, maybe we have a parasitic drain, all right? And this is probably another, I guess, little module I'll type up for you guys is, is how to check for parasitic drains. A parasitic drain is if I leave my vehicle two nights, everything's turned off and I go back out in a couple of days time, turn the key on, vroom, the battery's dead. Well, something drained it out. Didn't do it all by itself. That's cool. there's a, somewhere there's a parasite in there. Okay. So the way to, to check for that is we have to have a fully charged battery. We're going to unhook the negative cable. We're going to put our multimeter on amps. We're going to put one end of the um, our multimeter lead, one lead onto the, the battery, and one lead onto the end of the negative cable. So we're making a complete circle with our electrons. Now I just turn the key on. And I see what the amperage reading is, all right? If I have, I think I've got a parasitic drain, I just start pulling one fuse at a time, all right? If the amperage stays the same, well, apparently that circuit's okay. Put it back in. Take out the next one, the next one. I'll pull out one fuse finally, pull it out. That amperage, bloop, it goes way down. Aha, uh -huh. that's where the problem is. And that particular circuit, you know, it might be that I have, um, Corrosion might be a bare wire that's just touching on the frame. It could be a myriad of different things, all right? So that's something that your, your producers can check pretty, pretty easily, all right? Wires, um, your producers are quite capable of replacing wires. Wires get broken, they get corroded, you know, get wrapped around drive lines, whatever. All right, there's no problem at replacing them. The issue is how they replace them, all right? Um, those little plastic butt connectors that you crimp, no, we don't want to use those things. They're a disaster waiting to happen. I hate those then. That would be pet peeve number four, actually. <laughs> Keeping track? Okay, you awake? Okay. <laughs> What we want to do is use solder and heat shrink. All right, and there's very few people actually use that anymore. The reason why we want to use solder is we want to get a good connection. The reason I want to then cover that with heat shrink is I want to seal all the moisture and crap out of that good connection I just made. Because that's probably why we're making it. We got something wrong with our wire, we're replacing it, all right? Do not use acid core solder. Always use rosin core. Acid core, as the name would suggest, will eat up the wires and it'll also eat up the uh, insulation. So we're now we're back to ground zero. We just defeated what we're trying to do. So rosin core solder, all right? There is some other ones that I have used in the past. Um, I know that HO and Carquist both sell, I'm not sure Napa does as well, maybe even Big R. But it's actually, it's a, they're about yay line. They look like a butt connector, but they actually have a ring of solder on the inside of them. All right? So you slide one, you slide the whole thing on one of your wires. Then you bear the ends of the wires where you're going to make your connection, twist them together, pull the, the solder over the connector. Then you just put a flame on there at a distance, and that just melts the solder. Goes into the wires, seals them up, and they, the actual plastic part is not plastic. It's actually heat shrink. 
So you just keep heating it and the heat shrink shrinks down around the wire. They actually work pretty good. I kind of like them. All right. There is another butt connector that I've used quite a bit too that um, you actually do crimp them, but the, the outside of it is not plastic again. It's all, it is, again, is heat shrink. So you'd crimp them, the two ends are either spliced together, and then you just put the flame on there, the heat, or actually heat, not flame, heat, and the heat shrink, shh, and makes a nice, nice seal, all right? But just to use the, the butt crimp, no, let's not do those things. My God, I hate those things. But are they in my toolbox? Absolutely. In Absolutely. Pinch. In a pinch. You've got to do what you've got to do, right? Okay. Now, that's one thing I would tell my producers. You know, I would absolutely carry those in my toolbox. Absolutely. Make the repair, but when I get back to the shop, I would undo my repair and do it right. Inspect to this thing could prevent maintenance, right? A butt connector will fail. It's not a matter of if. It's just a matter of when. It will. All right? Well, we kind of defeated why we're doing preventive maintenance if we don't look after it. Okay? Connectors. So uh, there's a, a little strip of steel of various formulations on the end of a wire. And typically there's a male and female. Well, they lock together, right? Well, the plastic piece around that is what we call a connector. The metal piece is the terminal, and the plastic piece around the outside is called the connector. Most of those have some type of a locking mechanism on them. Once we get them together, they you know, snap over a hinge or whatever to kind of hold them in place. And I can guarantee you, we can go out to the parking lot right now, and we can look at a whole bunch of different vehicles. I can guarantee you a bunch of those locks are broken. All right? The kicker is we need to replace those connectors. You can replace those connectors without replacing wiring harnesses and all that good stuff. You gotta have the right tools and you have to have a lot of patience. All right, because those little tangs, those little metal terminals have little locking tangs in that hold them into the connector. And trust me, they are a bugger to get out of there. They really can be done, which is where patience comes in. All right, so if the lock is broken, then you probably need to have your, um, and if your producers aren't real comfortable with that, then they maybe want to run up to town and get a, you know, a technician to take care of that for them. Because eventually, what's going to happen is those two connectors are going to vibrate loose. Electrical tape. <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> okay, pet peeve number. <laughs> electrical tape would work, but electrical tape also because of weathering loses stickiness and unravels and yeah. So. I know. <laughs> now we're talking. <laughs> Grounds. Oh boy. This can be the bane of existence. Typically your grounds are not going to be for one individual circuit. They're going to be for multiple circuits. So if you have multiple or your, 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 your customer, your producer has multiple symptoms then they need to get into a wiring diagram and figure out where the grounds are at. It might be corrosion, it might be that we've got too many grounds on one teeny little bolt. A um, good example I can give you on that one happened to me. Um, I volunteered to service and maintain the ambulance and the fire trucks in Geraldine when I was down there, just you know, did it. And we got a new, I was actually on the board of directors and an ambulance driver, and we got a new ambulance, well new to us anyway. And you know, it had all the fancy whistles and bells, it had electrical this and big fancy lights and signs and Lord knows what else this damn thing had. Well, the first ambulance run I did I had to go from Geraldine to the country, then up to um, Benefice in Great Falls. And we were going down the highway and there's a lot of traffic, so we were hitting sirens and lights and I don't know what else we were hitting. And things started to not work correctly, and that's when I got pretty nervous. You're running at 90 miles an hour, and things aren't working right. That's kind of scary. So got back to this. Yeah, we, we got the patient up there. We all survived. We got back home. Next day, I pulled it out, and I started looking at the grounds. And I had a quarter-inch bolt that had 17 circuits. 17. I will never forget that. I said, you are freaking kidding me was unbelievable. Doesn't have 17 on one ground now, I can assure you that. All right, so I, all we had to do was we just had to find some other good grounds and we split the circuits out and that took care of the problem. 
So one big thing about cantilever with grounds is multiple circuits on one ground. But if you get corrosion on that one ground, you can have multiple symptoms on a lot of circuits. All right. And corrosion on grounds is a huge issue. Uh, on highway, you know, we use mag chloride up in Hill County. I'm not sure what other counties use. When it gets to wintertime, we use mag chloride, and that stuff is extremely corrosive. I've seen brand new vehicles that look like they were 30 years old if you just look at the corrosion. Terrible. But, you know, that's the way it is. All right? So that's where your, your producers need to really take some time and clean those up and put a coat of paint over the top of them or whatever to try and keep that corrosion to an absolute minimum because that will cause you some very, very significant headaches. Very significant. Been down that road, okay? So why would they design something to have that many grounds on? I honestly, I don't think it was designed that way. I think it was someone did that for what, it, yeah, redesign. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. You know, it scared the crap out of me. So. Okay, sensors, gotta love them, all right? You, you know, you and your, your producers, we're in the age now, so that DT-466, that black engine we first looked at, even that Cummins, that black L-10, there's no sensors on those cotton-picking things, none at all. We had a couple of switches, you know, they're solenoids, but they're not sensors. A sensor is an input for the computer. Okay, it is picking up a signal, which is sending back to the computer, so the computer can look at it and decide what the heck it's going to do. And most of that is to do with fueling. All right? So your sensors, love them or hate them, they're not going away anytime soon. And some of them are getting very complex. All right? The nice thing about the newer systems, um, probably 2006 and you know, a newer, is we have a system called a CAN bus, C-A-N, that is Controller Area Network. And that is basically a two-twisted two, wire, two twisted wire backbone which is connected to every single control module, ECU, whatever you want to call it, on that particular vehicle piece of equipment. So a, a vehicle speed sensor is a good example. That signal from that sensor is used for braking, for transmission controls, uh, it's used for engine fueling, it's used for automatic traction control, it's used for anti-lock braking, uh, rollover stability technology, and the list goes on. All right, that one sensor. Well, I just named six. So therefore, theoretically, I should have six vehicle speed sensors to go in for each of those processes, right? Well, no, we're not gonna do that, we're gonna have one. And that signal goes on to that wire backbone, that twisted wire, and that signal is sent to every single computer, controller, module, whatever the terminology is. So you have a, a module for your electric locks and your electric windows. Believe it or not, there's actually a computer that controls that. Does the computer really care about what the vehicle speed sensor is saying? It could give a rat's behind about that. So it's just going to ignore it. It sees it, it's just going to ignore it. All right. Does the anti-lock brakes really care if you're rolling the window up or down? Probably not, so it's gonna completely ignore that. So every module will look at the information. If it wants to use it or use it, if it doesn't, it just ignores it. So, but that, the point of that is that control area network will lessen the amount of wiring that we now have and also the lessen the amount of sensors, which is a good thing, all right? Once we started getting more and more computers and more sensors and more wiring and more connectors and more terminals and more grounds, Things got really complicated really, really quickly. And the environment that your producers run in off highway, in the middle of a stubble field, the middle of winter feeding out hay or whatever, we're not exactly very nice to those pieces of equipment. We're kind of hard on them. So we're running into lots and lots of issues. You know, the companies were of sensors failing, wires getting broken, you know, blah, blah, blah. All right? So visual inspection by your producers, they need to be checking out every single connector that goes into a sensor, every single wire connector that goes back to the ECM or whatever. It's, it, it takes some time. It takes a lot of time to visually inspect all those. If there's issues, then they need to take care of it. All right? 
Some of your sensors are what we would call a hot sensor for better terminology. So they are powered from, uh, typically it's going to be a five volt uh, signal source from the ECM <coughs> that kind of makes the sensor active. Okay. If your producers are pretty adept at diagnosing wiring and they have their multimeters, that could send them down the wrong path. They know that there's 12 volts in that battery, right? Or 12.6, actually. Well, then they look at that sensor and there's only 5 volts coming to that sensor. Ooh, boy, I got a problem. I got a big time problem. Well, actually, no, they don't because there should only be 5 volts going to that sensor, okay? So one thing that your producers need to get more adept at looking at is wiring diagrams. They can be their best friend or they can be their absolute worst enemy. I've seen some really, really good ones and I've some, seen some really sucky ones too, okay? So wiring diagrams, you know, and it's going to take some time for them to get used to those, but that's going to tell them a, a lot of information um, on paper about their particular vehicle or piece of equipment. Now, the only wrong thing about a wiring diagram, I could also say this about a, like a, a schematic for an air brake system. Looks great on the sheet of paper, but that, what's on that sheet of paper looks absolutely nothing what it looks, looks like on that piece of machinery. I mean, nothing like it. All right? But it gives you a pretty good start. Okay? We've talked about this once already. Uh, the ECM, the ECU, our modules, um, they're either going to be air-cooled, Fuel cooled or both. All right. That Caterpillar C12, it was air and uh, water, or excuse me, fuel cooled rather. Um, that's the best of both worlds. Okay. But once those electrons start running around those ECMs, especially those injector drivers, those injector drivers are taking that 12.6 volts and they're ramping that up to 110 volts. Do you think there's going to be some heat involved with that? You better believe it. They're also cycling at, you know, parts of milliseconds. If I'm in a high pressure common rail fuel system and I'm going to, or actually I'm not going to do anything, the ECM wants to energize and de-energize, put seven shots of fuel in that combustion chamber. That's a lot of cycle time for those, those warm um, injector drivers. So there's going to be some pretty serious heat created there. So we have to absolutely cool that ECM. So if you have a startability problem on a hot day, you know, we had a, we had, we've done a bunch of field work, we come in for lunch, and we go out back, the engine's still pretty warm, hard starting, well, maybe that's because the ECM is saying, whoa, horse, we've got an issue here, all right? So they will self-start shutting things down. It could get to the point where we're going to start burning up transistors and diodes. If I toast, completely toast a whole ECM, that is a piece of cake to diagnose. Piece of cake. If I toast a diode or a transistor inside the ECM, ugly. That ain't quite so easy to diagnose. That's really, really tough. When you diagnose, you're still going to replace the whole ECM, but it's going to take you a long time to get that figured out. All right? So keeping those things cool is very important. Okay, any questions on those? Um, I did just have a couple of, what else is I going to talk about there? Um, I had two thoughts going through my mind and I got sidetracked. I'll maybe think of it tonight. How good duct tape is to fix things? Yeah, that's what it was. <laughs> as long as we use a 200 mile an hour duct tape right. with the flames on it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> For styling. We've got to be styling. How are we doing? I'm not sure because I know you've said it a hundred times, but what does ECM stand for? <laughs> uh, it, it actually, it can stand for different things. Okay. And actually, I haven't said it a hundred times. I don't think I've said it at all. I think <laughs> it's like, holy crap. What no, I, and that's a good question. I'm sorry, I should have told that. ECM can either stand for electronic control module or engine control module. ECU, the U becomes, instead of module, becomes unit. So engine control unit, um, uh, electronic control unit. Depends upon the manufacturers what they use for that terminology. Detroit, for example, doesn't use ECM or e, uh, ECU. It uses MCM, motor control unit. Why? I have absolutely no idea. That's what Detroit does. Okay. So again, we would now be back to that. Would actually probably, well, that would be part of an owner's manual thing. It'd also be back to a service manual thing as well to try and decipher some of that. Yeah. 
And that's part of our issue, especially in the ag world. Uh, every single manufacturer, actually in the automotive world too, and the on-highway construction has their own set of acronyms. The acronym might be the same, you know, same letters, but mean two completely different things. All right? So one thing you can tell your producers, do not ever guess at what an acronym is. Because, boy, have I been burned on that one. All right? Your diagnostic path or your pre even preventive maintenance path goes to heck in a handbasket pretty quick. So, you know, get onto the internet, get onto the, the deal's website, whatever, figure out what those acronyms mean. Yeah. Good question. Good question. What else do we have, guys? I've thrown a lot of stuff at you guys today. I'm proud of you. I, I really am. You're, you've, you've, you've done well. You guys have got some amazing questions. You really do. I'm impressed. Cleaning. <laughs> 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 well, you're putting your pen at me, so. Um, cleaning battery cables. What about, you talked about baking soda and hot water. What about mm -hmm. the stuff you can buy at the store? Do you feel that the baking soda and hot water is better? Uh, baking soda and hot water is a lot cheaper. Um, I have used some of these spray cleaners. Was yeah. not impressed. I felt I spent a lot of money and didn't get a, you know, I'm, I'm big into bang for my buck. If I don't get bang for my buck, I don't react real well, all right? So I would, I've always, always used, I have actually used Coke a couple of times. The problem with Coke, it leaves a residue, yeah. which can lead to more corrosion, yeah. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Baking soda, hot water, and everybody's got baking soda. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Everybody but but Ben. Yeah. Oh, Ben will tonight. He's going to buy some tonight. And it's not for baking, man. Cleaning your battery. Yeah. There you go. Oh, that's one thing I was going to talk about. So um, a lot of times when you look at that flat top of the battery, it has a little bit of a slime on there. Okay? That's not good. That slime is actually residue of the electrolyte that's been boiled off. So for whatever reason, we're starting to overcharge that battery. Now, if you were to take the positive and negative terminal cables off, and you were to take your, multi, your digital multimeter and put it on amps for current flow, and you put one lead onto your negative terminal and your other lead somewhere in that um, slimy mess, you're going to find a current flow. That is a parasitic drain. And I've had some pretty serious amps flowing from one side to the other. Um, so again, baking soda is a good way to take care of that. Be very careful. Uh, even with a, a sealed battery that, you know, you can't, you know, so a battery with the vent caps, you can pop the caps off and look down and see the electrolyte. Okay, a sealed battery can't do that, but it, all, but it does have a vent. Try not to get that water and baking soda down that vent into the electrolyte, because it kind of neutralizes the electrolyte, is what it's supposed to do. Right, it works pretty well, actually. <laughs> does that mean that your battery is, I mean, if you have a parasitic drain, does that always mean that the battery is toast? Or no, no, no. Or you just no. need to correct. You just need, yeah, oh. yeah, take care of the problem. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, something uh, is parasitically drawing off the current flow in that battery. And, and probably it's, it's terminals. You terminal, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, corrosion. Um, yeah, maybe you're, you, you know, a lot of your passenger cars, when you open your trunk, you have this little light that comes on. Well, there's a little switch in there that if you close the trunk and the switch doesn't turn the light off, well, it's a parasitic drain. All right, so you don't know that because the trunk's closed. All right, same with the hood. You know, a lot of tractors, semis, they've got you know, extra lights on them. And um, in the environment, again, that we run in, you know, you get a lot of issues where you're going to vibration, battery, or the um, uh, wire, the brackets that hold the wires in place, they break. So now we've got wires flopping around. And we're eventually going to start chipping away at that insulation. And if that, we stop the vehicle, that insulation, the way the vehicle's angled, that's just kind of gently touching against the frame, the metal frame rail, we're going to start losing big time through there. Well, yeah. now that I've, and of course, that makes sense to me. I, I had a vehicle that the dome light 
was the parasitic drain. Sure. So I pulled the light bulb out and didn't ever have any problem with it ever Right, again. right. Took care of that circuit. Yeah, yeah. That was my solution. <laughs> yeah, well, and that works. Yeah, yeah. Well, I didn't put, put a flashlight in there. <laughs> it works, yeah. Well, it was, it was easier than trying to trace the wire. Well, through the headliner? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Because it was an old junker vehicle. And yeah. Yeah. That now you did the right thing. That's good. Time, so. Yeah, that's good. Another thing on electrical circuits, we always have to have some type of circuit protection. So that's either going to be a few, typically a fuse or a circuit breaker. If you have a circuit with no circuit protection, you will have a fire. There has been more than one farmer's shop or technician shop burned to the ground because some person put in some accessory, CB radio, you know, whatever, but did not put in any type of a fuser circuit breaker. There's a dead short to ground and we had a fire and things went to burning. Not good, okay? The reason why a, a fuse, so fuses are rated in amps, okay? We have anything down, what's the smallest? I think a 2.5 all the way up to a, like a 90 amp. Actually, I've seen as big as 120, okay? That is the maximum that that current flow that that particular circuit can carry. So, for example, I might have a light circuit that has, I'm just gonna pick a number, has a 10 amp fuse in that circuit, okay? So we power at the back of the fuse box, and power comes out of the fuse and goes out to my lights, and then we go back to ground, all right? The wire gets broken. That wire is now hot when I turn the lights on, but it's hitting on the frame rail. That's a dead short to ground because I don't, um, you know, with the lights out of the system now. Poof, the fuse blows. So what are we going to do? Well, hell, we're just going to get a bigger fuse. <laughs> right? Well, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, I don't want to beat up on your producers, but you know what? That's what they're going to do. All right? Putting in a bigger fuse, guys, is not the answer. Not even close. We need to diagnose, get back to base, and figure out what the hell the problem is. That fuse blew for one reason, because we have too much current flow in that particular circuit. Why? Well, that's what we've got to figure out. I have seen, remember those old uh, glass fuses we had? Okay. You guys ever seen fuse boxes with 22 shells stuffed in there? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> as long as they're spin 22 shells, that's good. I've actually seen live 22 shells stuff. To that kind of bothered me a little bit. <laughs> okay, so it made the... Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, did the circuit work? Yeah. Did we have circuit protection? Hell no. Do we, uh, we have a potential for a fire? Oh yeah. You better believe it. All right. And that, that is one thing that you know, you, when your producers, you know, they can't all afford, but actually probably none of them can afford to go and buy new pieces of equipment or semis or pickups or whatever. <laughs> and the thing that they really need to watch is uh, what accessories have been added in there, okay? Um, I, one of my customers um, bought a, it was like a four-year-old Peterbilt semi when I was in business, a really nice truck. And he was, I mean, he's, a, he's a trucker, he was using it for his business. Gorgeous truck. And he wanted me just to kind of check it off. He had already, bought, he had already purchased the thing, but he, he said that the, the, I think it was his radio wasn't, wasn't working correctly. He just wanted me to check it over. So pulled the headliner out. Oh my Lord. I can see why his radio wasn't working. So I wonder that anything was working. Uh, I don't know who did the wiring, but they have absolutely no business ever touching wiring again. It was, an, oh man, it was really, really bad. So he the says, well... The technician that went through your course. Yeah, <laughs> probably was. <laughs> Fail his butt. <laughs> so he wanted to leave the, the semi in my shop overnight. I said, oh, that's not happening. No way. I said, we got a chance. This thing's actually going to catch fire. He says, what? I said, oh yeah. So we actually left it outside. We disconnected all the batteries. And I, I was, it scared me. It really did scare me. It actually took me about one and a half days to get all that. Actually, no, it was just on two days to get that wiring figured out. 
it was a mess. It was, it was very, very scary. But you couldn't see it because it was under that headliner up the top. No one was going to see that. Out of sight, out of mind, right? So that's one thing that your producers probably want to double check is all those little details such as, you know, if we have an extra CB radio on there, well, where is it wired into? Do I have circuit protection? Is it wired into something that's going to cause an issue with something else? All right, I've seen, um, uh, I've had my students actually do this. You know, they come up with these really nice, nice vehicles, but they got some really crappy stereos. So, you know, we're going to upgrade. We've got our Kenworth and JVCs, whatever else stereos. So we pull the old one out, we put the new one in, and we just, you know, we can't be bothered rewiring it correctly. So we just snip a wire, some wire that's hot, and we wire that puppy in. And I've seen it done where they have the car running, they turn the stereo on, and the car dies. It's like, whoa! <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's just weird stuff like that. that the radio worked. The radio worked. <laughs> and apparently that time, that was all that mattered. <laughs> Till they went to go home. But I would say that that probably happens a lot, because producers always are wired. <laughs> oh, I need to have a radio for this, or for this piece of equipment, or I need to have put this accessory yeah. in, because it would be a lot better if I had this. And so they do. I think they just yeah. snip a wire and... Just piggyback it, and yeah, yeah. And that's becoming to be more of a problem. If you look at, you know, our, our telematics with our uh, GPSing and our automatic steering and you know, all that stuff that's being added in, a lot of that is coming um, pre-wired from the factory, which is a really, really good thing. I really like that. But older ones that are being retrofitted, well, no, they're not. Now the, your producer or the technician, someone has to wire that in. Well, you know, where they're getting their, their supply from for the power Sometimes it's really, really good. Other times I just, I shake my head. You know, like, what were they thinking? Well, they weren't. They just found a hot source. They wired it in, kicked her out the door. Life is good. Well, actually, no, it's not. So that, that has become, it is a serious issue. It really is. But if they're pre-wired now, I think They're plug and play. Then they yeah. Yeah, which took care of a lot of it. Um, you know, the older ones that are being retrofitted, so they're even yeah. they're wired that way. I mean, if, if they're not going to get a GPS maybe yep. for a while. Yep. Yep, they just probably have just a, a blank cover over where it would sit. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of nice. Yeah. Okay, anything else about wiring that we can think of or questions? Okay, I think I pretty much covered everything on that I wanted to cover for today anyway, so. Uh, I know <coughs> we always, when we were done with our tractors at the end of the year, we'd pull the batteries out. Yep. Um, so I, I'm assuming that's worth the while to do that. Yes, it is. So that's a very good point, Ben. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Extend the life of your batteries. Yep. It does. Yep. Um, but, yeah. Then the only thing I was thinking, because you, then you said start your, you know, tractor once every. Month. <laughs> well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Those batteries are not fun to take out. That, that, that is. Yeah. Once a year. Yeah. I mean. That 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 yeah, and that is a true statement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and that, yeah, I mean, that there's, there's two good points you made right there. So number one is if we can get the batteries <laughs> out of that vehicle or piece of equipment, if we're going to lay it up over the winter time, absolutely. Um, it does extend the life of those very expensive batteries. There's no doubt about that. What if get, you disconnect, disconnect the terminal? Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm, yeah, we'll get to that. Yep, that's another option. So if we get the batteries out, we put them in a nice warm shop, you will get a lot more years of life out of those batteries, absolutely. So let's go back to yours, and then we'll come to disconnecting. So yeah, I, I'm a big proponent of firing those engines up and getting that oil. Well, crap, now I've got to haul those big frickin' batteries back out there, you know? And some are easy to put in, and others really, really suck, you know, when you got to lift them like up here somewhere. Yeah. So now we come to disconnecting. Um, I would be a big proponent of that, <laughs> of maybe leaving the batteries in if they're not really accessible and just disconnecting both your positive and your negative terminals. Just get them the heck off of there. All right. Now your battery is going to get cold, but um, the thing with, with, with cold is with connected, we can have some parasitic drains. That's kind of what drains your battery down, especially the cold weather. Okay. So, so what if you have a big enough shop to park all your equipment in and it's warm? Is that 
Uh, I would just I would just disconnect and leave the batteries in there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, gosh, John, there's something else that you said too. I was going to mention. I don't know what it was now. Yeah. I'll think of it tonight. Maybe not. Um, but yeah, that, I mean that's that's uh, a good point right there. Okay. Anything else? Question on, aside from on the idling issue that you mentioned earlier, does that have any excess or sort of excessive idling? Does that have any electrical implications, or is it? Uh, actually, it does. Yeah. Especially if you're idling with your lights on and your heat, you're probably going to idle because it's cold out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to keep that heater running. When I keep our lights on, you know, blah blah blah. Well, at an idle you're not going to have enough RPM in your alternator to keep up with whatever accessory you have turned on. So now we're asking our battery to do the same thing. So we go to the grocery store and you know, it's, we come back out, the pickup's nice and warm and life is good. But, so then we just you know, trundle two blocks to go home and we shut the outfit off all right, or whatever. You know we don't have time to replace what we just used up in the battery. So now we're going to start chipping away at our battery. We're never going to ever get it fully charged. The only, there's only two ways to charge up a battery. Number one is you get your vehicle started and you hit the highway and you run for about 65 miles an hour for two hours. That'll charge it up. Okay. The other way is to unhook your battery and put a battery charger on there. All right. That's really the only two ways to charge up your battery. Okay. Your alternator will do it if there's enough RPM there and a long enough time to do it. But just to sit, you know, I've had people tell me, well, I'll, I'll just charge my battery up, I'll just fire the engine up and let it idle. <laughs> Go right ahead, it's not going to charge your battery up. You're going to waste a whole bunch of fuel. So, so. You made a comment there. So when you put your battery charger on, you want to remove the cables? You know, you don't have to. I always do. I, um, I really have no reason why I do. I just do. Oh, that was the other thing I was going to talk about. If you disconnect or have your producer disconnect the battery, make sure that they write down the presets for their radio. Okay? Um, if they're stereo, you know, you have your button one, two, three for different stations, they're your presets. I learned that the hard way. I replaced a battery, and, and she was the sweetest old lady you'd ever come across. She honestly was. Until you mess with <laughs> Yeah, until I mess with the presets. Okay. Oh boy. So we replaced the battery and she was back in my shop 10 minutes later and she was ticked. Oh man. I mean, her freaking wheels could have fell off. It wouldn't have mattered. Her presets. presets for 20 years. I know. It's exactly pretty much what she said. And you know what? I, I didn't even think about it. I hadn't even written them down. I was like, oh my lord. So after she ran and raved, and we got them all set again, and life was good. <laughs> so, but you know what? She was a customer who, in one job, she gave me a hundred dollar tip. You look after people like that. Yeah, if I had spent a midnight, I would have got those damn presets <laughs> reset. <laughs> but she was pretty hot. She really, and, and well, <laughs> I mean, anger-wise. <laughs> <laughs> good lord. <laughs> So, walk <laughs> If you have a dead battery and somebody jumps your vehicle, it's, people are like, oh, let it, let it run for about a half hour. That's crap. That will put a surface, what we call a surface charge on it. Okay. All right, and that's all it's going to do. It's not going to charge your battery. No. no. Everybody does it. Yes, so I do. Will it start again? It um, might. Maybe. Maybe, yeah. If it's got a good surface charge and if everything else you know, is a nice warm day, if it's a cold day, probably not. Yeah. No. But if you have to put a brick on the accelerator and let it sit there. But, uh, the high idle. Now well, that'll get you close, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Actually, that just, we'll just digress there for a second. Uh, not about the brick, but about the jump starting. Do you guys know how to correctly hook up a set of jumper cables? Yes, but I, I think we so. Think we but do. Since you just asked, <laughs> you know, now that you asked the question, I'm questioning it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you guys tell me. Well, the negative goes to the frame, right? Very, very last, good. And it goes on last. Yeah. Okay, so what we do is we have, on our jumper cables, we have two red clamps, and we have alligator clamps, and we have two black ones, right? Mm -hmm. We have, so this is my dead battery. Actually, that's my live one because it's northern. I have my dead battery over here. 
My first hookup, I take my red clamp and I hook to the positive of this battery, my good battery. Second hookup, I hook to the positive of the dead battery. Okay. Third hookup, I hook to the ground terminal of the live battery. The fourth hookup, this ground over here, does not ever go to the battery. It goes to some other ground, right? And that completes my connection. Second question, why do I not hook my fourth clamp to the dead battery? And I guarantee you, very few of your producers will know the answer to this one. You guys heard of hydrogen gas? When a battery charges or discharges, it produces hydrogen gas. You mix flames and a spark and hydrogen gas, things are going to blow up. And I have seen the results of a battery blowing up. I never, ever want to be around a battery when it blows up. Very, very bad deal. So if I was to make that fourth connection to the battery, I'm completing that circuit. There will be a spark. Guarantee it. If there's hydrogen gas there, it sucks to be you. All right? Really, really bad. But people do that all the time. Absolutely they do. And, and they don't look up to the positive, not the one that's good. I mean, I've seen them look up to smoke yeah. Yeah. Is that dead battery, because mm -hmm. that's the one that they get out, and that's the one that's having the problem, and then they flag somebody down. And right, right. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of scary, there's some very, very scary stuff that's done out there. Very scary. And that's one of them. Yeah. So how do you feel about those little jump starters that have the battery operating? Love them. Them? Love you just pick them up? Okay. Yep. Yep. Love them. If you get a good one. I do have a good one. Okay, good. Yeah. No, they're fine because they have an on-off switch. Well, I've been around having an on-off switch. So you hook up, but nothing's happening until you click the switch on. All right, so yeah. Yeah, I, I really like those so things. And you hook both of those up? The yep. Like yep. To the terminals. Yeah. Oh, yep. so you like the ones with the on-off yep. on switch. switch. Yep. Oh. So you don't have one on yours? Maybe not. But I, if I said <laughs> my dad got it for me for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, knowing your dad, you probably got one actually. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Check it and see. Okay. Yeah, but no, I. It's on all the time. Yeah. It's yeah. On all <laughs> Must be. Yeah. I never flipped a switch. There's no switch to flip on. Okay, so yours is, a, is constantly live then. Um, <clears throat> those ones I do still like, but uh, just be careful. Uh, you know, hook up your positive, I will put the ground somewhere else. Okay. Yeah. So when you throw uh, it and, the yeah, and, and, <laughs> and Joel mentioned too that I see all kinds of people who smoke around batteries, light up their cigarettes around batteries. Oh, gosh. Oh, my goodness. That's some really, really scary stuff. You guys ever seen what a blown up battery does? I worked on a Mustang one time that had, um, the battery blew up and we basically, we actually were, he ended up replacing the hood. We were just gonna repaint it, but that didn't pan out real well. Uh, we replaced every single scrap of wire, plug wires, everything under the hood. Uh, we replaced valve cover, battery tray, obviously the battery, the grill, um, it took out the radiator. I mean, this is some serious stuff. Very, very serious. You know, one of those things lets go. You, do, you sure as hell don't want to be around it. You know, so be very, very careful around those. So what is the primary cause of them? The hydrogen gas that's produced when the battery charges or discharges, just from the chemical process. So it's mostly, they won't just do it if it's not with the battery charger for any. Uh, well, no, if it's hooked to a battery charger, you will have the hydrogen gas. So if I hook up a battery charger, I do not have it plugged into the wall. I hook up my battery charger to the battery, and then I plug it in, and then I turn the thing on. So there's no sparks. You set your wrench on it, and it touches both sides. Then you'll have a spark. <laughs> really, really big spark. <laughs> so do we have more long batteries than... than are there more blown batteries, you think, than is actually talked about? Because, I mean, I see people doing that. Okay, that stuff up. Yeah, there's actually, 
there, there's not as many as what there potentially could be. Let me put it that way. But when they, when they do, it's it's bad. oh, it's really bad, really, really bad. Yeah, there's one downtown here. Just thinking of that. No, it was down by Heltney's. You know where Heltney's used to be? Down, it's, it's one of the by one of the bars. Heltney's was a, a service station, and um, this was I uh, was it a little Fiero, I think, and the battery blew up. It actually blew the starter motor off the, the engine. And that, that's some serious force, serious. And it totally, I, mean, I think there was a, maybe a hole about yay big of where part of the starter went through the radiator. Now, if anyone had been standing there, I mean, they're, they're dead in the conversation. So there isn't as many as what there potentially could be. Yeah. There's not many things about vehicles scare me, but that, that does scare me. Makes me very, very and nervous. Did you hook to a battery charger when that happened? Uh, no, they were hooking up jumper cables. Oh. Yeah. So somebody was standing there. Yeah, but they, yeah, they were actually, they're off to this. The vehicle was here, there, the, hot, the live vehicle was here. Yeah. So they were reaching over here and they hooked it up and boom. So they didn't get hurt. But I mean, if they had been in front, they would have been killed. Yeah. <laughs> but the person that had the working vehicle, potentially. Yeah, that's who it was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Stopping to help you out. Yeah. He is um, getting toasted. Now they're toasted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Okay, my friends. So we call it good for today. All right. So we'll go home and we'll get some food and get some rest. And I'll see you here tomorrow morning. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Have another round tomorrow. Yeah. yeah. So do you have auto start in your vehicles? Uh, doing uh, one van. Yeah. Yeah, but it came factory installed. I've installed those things. They're a freaking nightmare, man. The last one was so expensive to install. Why? Because I did it. No, no, no. They're tricky to install. No one really wants to install them. Yeah. Because it's pass codes and security codes, depending upon the manufacturer and.